as we've done before, let me ask some questions to um, provoke our thinking regarding the doctrine of creation. Question one, how important is the doctrine of creation? Two, what are the essential aspects of the doctrine of creation? What are the important things that the Bible teaches us about the doctrine? Thirdly, what does the doctrine of creation teach us about the value of the material world? Four, what does the doctrine of creation teach us about angels and demons? Five, what is the special place of man in creation? And six, what determined the destiny um, of the original creation? Now, by way of introduction, um, we need to just consider the importance of the doctrine of creation. And we need to look no further than Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to see how important the doctrine is. The Bible begins with a statement, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And so we, we can assume, um, because this is the way God structured his revelation of himself, that the doctrine is the foundation of what follows. And we see that it's the basis of many other doctrines in the Bible. For example, the doctrine of God's sovereignty over his creatures that we looked at in chapter 3, uh, God's decree. Why is God sovereign? Why does he have the right to do with his creation what he chooses? And the answer is simply because he is the creator. He made everything. What about salvation? The doctrine of salvation. Sometimes we set um, salvation as a spiritual thing over against the material world. But what after all is God saving? God is saving his people whom he created. God is saving the world that he created. And so the doctrine of creation is also fundamental to the doctrine of salvation. If we just now come to the confession itself, and you can look at the notes that I've given to you, um, just uh, an overview quickly of the chapter. You see that it's divided into three parts there. Um, part 1, the overview of creation, part 2, the apex of creation, and part 3, the fulcrum of creation, in other words, that which determined its destiny. And uh, in the original, we have three paragraphs, um, which fall neatly under these three headings. So let's, let's, let's then look at the overview of the creation as it's given to us here. The confession states, in the beginning, it pleased the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, to create the world and all things in it. All was very good. In this way, God glorified His eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. There are six points that we can identify in this statement about the doctrine of creation, each one helping us to come to a better understanding of the doctrine. Firstly, we have the statement, in the beginning. When did God create? God created in the beginning. Now that statement, which comes directly from Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, as you'll no doubt recognize, um, is uh, full of meaning. It's full of meaning. It's not just telling us when in time it happened. It's telling us a lot more. When the Bible talks about the beginning, what it's really talking about is the beginning of the existence of all things apart from God. The time at which everything other than God began to exist. And uh, what this tells us is, firstly, only God exists from eternity to eternity. In Psalm 90 we read, from eternity to eternity you are God. Everything else had a point in time when it began. Some things will continue to exist to eternity. Mankind, uh, uh, human beings are eternal as far as the future is concerned, but they had a beginning. But God exists from eternity to eternity. This uh, statement also tells us that when God began to create, all things, matter, spiritual beings, Angels and demons, time as we know it, first came into being. And what this implies is the doctrine that we call creation ex nihilo, creation out of nothing. 
And that's very, very important for us to understand that God didn't use pre-existing material. There was not some pre-existent matter that God simply took and fashioned into um, the creation as we know it. God created everything out of nothing by the word of His power. And therefore God Himself is the sole originator of all things. There is nobody else who has a share in the origination, in the bringing into existence of what we see in the creation before us and we might say of what we don't see as well. Very important. And then uh, flowing from this also, we find that there is a distinction between God and everything else that exists. Philosophers speak about an ontological distinction, a difference in kind. God is a different kind of being from everything else. We can put God on the one side and everything else, angels, demons, atoms, mountains, water, whatever you like to name is on the other side. God is one kind of being. Everything else is created. And of course that sets um, the biblical doctrine of God apart from the Eastern philosophies which speak about um, a pantheistic understanding of God. God is in uh, nature. God is in the plants and the trees. Uh, sort of a pantheistic understanding where there is a blur between God's being and nature. However, the Bible teaches us that God is one kind of being. And everything else is a different kind of uh, object or being. So we see the first thing in the beginning God created tells us many things about God and about the creation. The author of creation, the confession emphasizes that the triune God is the author of creation. All three persons of the Trinity were involved in the creation. In the beginning it pleased the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to create the world and all things in it. And it's important for us to understand at every point of our doctrine, whether we're talking about salvation, whether we're talking about the being of God, whether we're talking about creation, that God is a trinity and that God works as a trinity. To be a bit more specific, we can say that the Father was, uh, is the one who planned and originated the creation. The Son is the agent through whom God creates. And there are some magnificent passages um, in the New Testament that speak about uh, the Son, Christ, as being the agent of creation. For example, Colossians 1 verses 15 to 17 he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Through Him all things came into being. Hebrews 1 verse 2 and John 1 verses 2 and 3 as well. And even in the Old Testament we have hints of this in Proverbs chapter 8 where wisdom is spoken about as the craftsman at God's side when He created the world. And from a New Testament perspective it is right for us to understand wisdom as being the second person of the Trinity, namely Jesus Christ. And then the Holy Spirit, well, right in the beginning again, Genesis <coughs> chapter 1 verse 2, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was formless and void. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the deep. And uh, the idea really is that the Holy Spirit as in other aspects of God's working, supplies the dynamic power by which God's plan is brought into effect. The Holy Spirit is the one who, who created the power and brought, about, brought the power to bear on, on what God was doing so that the creation would come into being. And it's wonderful to think how God works as a trinity. And that everything that he does bears the fingerprints of his nature as a triune God. Something else we learned from this first paragraph, uh, the extent of creation. Uh, it pleased the triune God to create the world 
and all things in it. And uh, once again, this comes from Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 to go no further. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And what the scripture means when it says that God created the heavens and the earth is not simply that God created two different things, namely the heavens and the earth. But everything from the heights of heaven down to the depths of the earth were created by God. And included in that would be um, spiritual beings, angels, um, angels who were related to four, namely the devil and his angels, right there in the heavens as the Hebrews conceived of it. The heavens themselves physically being the stars, the earth, and everything in the earth, everything visible and invisible. The original uh, confession uses those words just to emphasize the point visible and invisible. And the implication of this is that God rules over all things. God rules over all things. One God. We must not think in terms of the devil or of evil forces as God's opposite numbers somehow having control of a portion of the creation um, and in competition with God. It is one God who created all things. He is therefore over all. And we could explore that in, at greater length um, if there was time. Another thing that we find here is the duration of creation. Uh, God created the, the world and all things in it in six days. And the confession simply states six days. In our day, um, living where we do, 300 years, 300 odd years after the writing of the confession, this has become a hotly debated issue, particularly in the last couple of decades. And I think we must accept that the writers of the confession would not have been aware of all the different facets of the debate. And uh, they were simply stating the words of Scripture, uh, Genesis chapter 1, which they no doubt accepted at face value. Just a couple of comments here in our current context. Um, for many Reformed Baptists and other Reformed Christians, belief in a literal six days is an important test of orthodoxy. And uh, those who do not believe in a literal six days are regarded as unorthodox, as um, compromising the scripture. However, on the other side, there are many highly respected Reformed theologians who have not held to the literal six days. And we might mention Benjamin Warfield, the Dutch theologian, Hermann Bavink, uh, Francis Schaeffer, uh, in this century, and also some very conservative Old Testament scholars. In recent years, Gleason Archer and Barton Payne are two names that one might mention here. And I think in view of this, we need to be careful not to approach the issue in a simplistic way. There are significant arguments on both sides of the debate, whether it's a literal six days or not. And what we need to do, I think, is to accept that Genesis chapters 1 and 2 speak about six days, they speak about six days for important reasons, uh, notably that it's linked to the Sabbath. Um, and in our confession, we assert that we believe whatever Scripture means about those six days without necessarily being dogmatic that the meaning has to be one thing or another. In other words, we assert that we believe that God created the world in six days in whatever sense Genesis chapter 1 means the six days without necessarily making one or other interpretation a test of our, of our orthodoxy or of our faithfulness to Scripture. Of course, one could discuss this for many days and weeks on end. Uh, something else we, we learn about creation here in this first paragraph, uh, the fifth point that we can draw out is the result of the creation. All was very good. Everything was very good. And this is repeated in Genesis chapter 1 uh, quite a few times. And the important thing is here that the Bible does not teach us 
any kind of a dualistic worldview. Um, what, what I mean by dualistic worldview is that there is some part of creation which is evil and some part of it which is good. And it's a fight between the good and the evil parts of creation. Everything that God created originally was very good. In particular, what we need to understand is that matter, the physical world, our bodies, are part of what God created and part of what God created good. And uh, therefore we can contrast the biblical understanding of the material world with certain Greek philosophies which saw the, the body, the material world, as something very inferior and spirit, thought, was uh, the good part. Gnosticism, a heresy that came about at the end of the first century and in the second century AD, uh, which taught that God is spirit and God is good and matter is evil. And uh, salvation is a matter of escaping from uh, matter, from evil matter, evil material things. We find this even reflected in in modern day thinking, quite popular thinking amongst many Christians, we somehow have a, a feeling that the body is not quite spiritual, that it's more spiritual to be involved in a prayer meeting, let's say, than in, uh, than in eating, for example. Uh, whereas this is not the perspective of Scripture. All things are good. God created all things. Um, and that's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 31, whatever you, you do, whether you eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. And uh, this teaches us what redemption is, what salvation is. God is not saving us from the material world, as the Greeks thought. Salvation is not out of the material world, but God's salvation is a salvation of the material world, including His people the things that He has created. And this is very, very important for the way we live our Christian lives on a daily basis. Once again, it would be lovely to explore that at much greater length, but we must move on. And point number six in this overview of creation is the purpose of creation. In this way, God glorified His eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. The purpose of God creating the world is to glorify Himself. Psalm 104 verse 31, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord delight in His works. Revelation chapter 4 is a magnificent statement of this truth, where you have the four living creatures in heaven representing the entire creation, bowing down before God, continually bringing Him glory and honor and praise and worship. And what, what uh, the scripture is stating in that chapter is that the purpose of the whole creation is to bow down before God and bring Him glory and honor. So we see there in that very first paragraph many dimensions of this doctrine of creation. They're just given to us in seed form really. But you can see that if you place those seeds into the soil of God's Word and you allow them to grow, they, they make worlds go open for you in your understanding of God and of yourself and of the world around you. Let's move on to paragraph 2 there, also section 2 in the outline, that we have uh, the apex of creation. And we see here that man has a very special place in creation, that uh, while we had God on the one side and the rest of the creation on the other in paragraph 1, in paragraph 2 we have man on the one side and the rest of creation on the other. That uh, not in exactly the same way, but in some sense, as God is set apart from the rest of creation, so man is also set apart from the rest of creation. And if you were to take a scale, as it were, and you put the whole of creation on the one side and put man on the other side, we see that man counterbalances the scale. Man is to God the pinnacle, the apex of everything. 
that he made. Now there are some important statements about man here in this paragraph. Firstly, we have the constitution or the makeup of man. All creatures were made by God, the last to be fashioned being man and woman who received dominion over all other creatures of the earth. God gave man and woman rational and immortal souls and in all respects fitted them for a life in harmony with himself. Right, this paragraph or this section of the paragraph tells us something about the, the way man is made up. And here there is an essential difference between man and the rest of creation. We think of Genesis 2 verse 7 and uh, let's turn it together. The account of, let's say the second account of God's creation of man. The Lord God formed the man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being or uh, a, a more literal translation here would be man became a living soul. The Hebrew word nephesh is used. Now we see here that God <coughs> created man in a manner different from that in which he created all other creatures. He fashioned a body from the dust of the earth. There was man's body, but notice that that body wasn't alive. In other words, man's body had no life in itself. It was only after God breathed into it the breath of life that the body came alive. And then man became a living being or a living soul. Now, we haven't got time to investigate whether a man is a trichotomy, body, soul and spirit, or a dichotomy, body and soul, or whether man is just one, you know, just a body, soul, spirit, unity. Uh, but uh, the confession itself, and particularly in chapter 31, um, works from the assumption that man is a body and soul together, two separate parts yet working in unity. And I think this is the best way to understand a man according to Scripture. In other words, man has an, an aspect of his being that is supernatural. He has a soul. And yet man is not body and soul sort of somehow loosely connected together that they can operate separately. But man as body and soul together is a united being and he always operates as body and soul together. There are many implications of this. For, for example, we should not set bodily life against spiritual life, which I've already alluded to when we spoke about the goodness of the material world. Uh, also, there is an interdependence between soul and body. The life of your soul depends on the life of your body. Just think about your emotions and how they're affected when you're very tired. Your body affects your soul. Just think about the change that comes in the way you behave when you get very happy about something. The soul affects the body. Uh, so we cannot separate body and soul in man. They work together. And therefore, we must understand that the way we are to function as human beings is as physical, spiritual beings together, working as units. And we cannot neglect any part of our humanity. Every part of our humanity has been created by God and is an important part of who we are and how we live. Uh, the second <coughs> section in paragraph 2 speaks about the image of God under the heading of the identity of man. Man was created in God's image, possessing knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. And this is really the thing that sets man apart from the rest of the creation, the fact that he was made in God's image. It's not said about any other part of creation. And that is why man in certain senses has the same relation to the rest of creation that God has to the creation because man was made in God's image. 
Now, <laughs> we can say two basic things about the image of God in man. Firstly, it pertains to the qualities that we have in our nature. Qualities that derive from the being of God. And the, the confession mentions here knowledge, righteousness, and true holiness. And I would encourage you to look up those texts that are given there. Genesis chapter 1, Ecclesiastes 1, Corinthians 11, James 3, 9, Colossians 3, 10, and Ephesians 4, 24 for a little bit more insight into those particular qualities. But essentially what we can say is that man has certain moral and spiritual qualities that make him like God. We are accountable for what we do. We are accountable for acting in a moral way. And if we do not act according to God's laws, we are held accountable in a way that an animal cannot be held accountable uh, no matter what it does. We are relational beings. We are able to live in community and relate to one another, once again in a way that animals cannot do. And many other things we could say about the nature of our being um, which derives from the being of God. But another aspect of the image of God is that man has a role in creation, a, a function, office, which is equivalent to God's role. And this is really stated in the first part of this paragraph. Man has been appointed to rule over the creation. Um, God gave, uh, sorry, the last to be fashioned being man and woman who received dominion over all other creatures of the earth. And so just as God rules over the creation, man being his image bearer has been appointed to rule in his place. This is the order which God has established in creation. And uh, the whole creation, the, the, the proper functioning of the creation is dependent on that order. The image of God in man. The last thing that is stated in this paragraph about man is uh, given the heading, the integrity of man, what it means is his perfect condition before the fall. The divine law was written in their hearts and they had power to obey it fully, yet being left to the liberty of their own mutable wills, transgression of the law was a possibility. Now we must understand that that is a statement of man before the fall. That is what man was like before sin came into the world. Notice they not only had the divine law written on their hearts, but they had the power to obey it fully. Yet they were left to the liberty of their own mutable wills and transgression of the law was a possibility. Now we see this um, taught in Scripture very clearly in Genesis chapter, chapter 2 and 3 also, uh, where we read that man and woman, Adam and Eve, were naked and they felt no shame where we see how the serpent reasons with Eve and talks about the knowledge of good and evil. Before Eve ate the fruit, she did not have that wisdom, as the serpent put it. She did not have that knowledge of good and evil. In other words, she wasn't aware of the thousands and millions of possibilities of evil in the world around. There was only one thing um, that she was aware of in which she could sin, and that was the... Uh, uh, breaking God's command and eating of the tree. However, after the fall, suddenly all the possibilities of evil were opened. And that is why the man and the woman looked at themselves and they saw that they were naked and they felt shame. And it's important for us to understand that we, in our position in history, do not stand where Adam and Eve stood before the fall. We do not have within ourselves, certainly not as unsaved people, the power to obey God's law fully. Um, we have this inclination, this corruption in us that uh, moves us towards the evil. But in the original state of creation, 
man was able, Adam and Eve were able to obey God. And that brings us on to the last paragraph, which here is entitled, The Fulcrum of Creation, or we might call it the hinge, the hinge of creation. Everything hinged on, the destiny of the creation hinged on something. What was that? The law of God in general was written in the hearts of the first human pair, but at the same time they were placed under a special prohibition not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Their happiness and fellowship with God depended upon their yielding obedience to His will. Also did the continuance of their dominion over the creatures. Okay, so you see how their future depended upon their obedience to God, but not only their future, also their dominion over the creatures. And because that was such an important part of creation, the destiny of the whole creation depended on this. Now it's interesting here that this particular confession, the Baptist confession, has taken this chapter word for word from the Westminster Confession, that was the Presbyterian one. Um, the only difference being that in the Westminster Confession, paragraphs 2 and 3 were one paragraph. However, here they've been divided into two. And it seems that our Baptist forefathers were trying to teach us something here, that there is something in this particular paragraph which is special something which has a significance of its own beyond simply telling us about man. And that's what we, we mean when we talk about the fulcrum of creation, the, the significance of this command that was given to Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree, the, the, the destiny of the entire creation hung on their obedience or lack of obedience to God. And uh, we need to understand here that the confession is beginning to introduce a concept which is fundamental to understanding the Bible and, and a concept which has been reflected, thankfully, in Reformed theology. And that is the concept of federal headship, of one uh, representative standing in the place of a much larger group. Adam and Eve, Adam in particular, standing in place of all of their descendants and all of the rest of the creation, the destiny of everybody else hanging on Adam. And of course we see it uh, in the redemption that Christ, the last Adam, stands in the place of all of his people. He is the first fruits of the new creation. Now I say the confession is starting to introduce this concept. It's not developed at all here. But it's good to, to recognize the beginning of it. And we'll see in chapters 6, 7, and 8 in particular uh, that this concept is developed in much greater detail. Let's come back then to the questions that we asked at the beginning just to summarize what we've done. How important is the doctrine of creation? Well, it's fundamental to everything else. Why? Well, what are its essential aspects? We saw um, it speaks about in the beginning, a phrase that is charged with meaning. The author of creation is the triune God, um, <clears throat> the extent of creation, all things, the duration of creation, the six days we discussed, the result of creation, everything very good, and the purpose of creation, God's own glory. And if you can understand those six things about the creation, you have a very good grasp of the biblical teaching of, on creation. What does the doctrine of creation teach us about the value of the material world? It is good not to be despised. Angels and demons, they were made by God. The devil is a created being. He is not God's opposite number. The angels are God's servants ministering to those who will inherit salvation. The place of man, Man is the pinnacle of God's creation. Everything depends on him being the one who bears the image of God. What determined the destiny of the original creation? It was the obedience of Adam and Eve. Wonderful doctrine, creation. I love it. It gives so much freedom, so much meaning to life, so much meaning 
to our salvation. Trust that the Lord will help us to grow in a richer knowledge of Him as we understand this doctrine. Just very briefly, are there any quick questions anybody would like to, to ask? All right. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and that we've been enriched this morning through your word. Lord, how we ask that you would cause these truths to sink deeply into our hearts, that we may understand ourselves as your creatures, your image bearers, as living here along with the rest of the creation for your glory. Thank you, God, that you made all things and that you made everything very good. Lord, we praise you and we rejoice in you. In Jesus' name, amen.